Thanks, everyone. I appreciate we're at the uh, end of a long session. I'll try and make this snappy. I'm not going to talk about ESG and I'm not going to talk about the market, but I will give an update on our projects and be fairly specific about it and where we're at. I think Dukedon's at an important point in its evolution. It's really a, a time that we're just changing the tone of it slightly away from an exploration project with a couple of nice looking resources to a, a development project that's got two nice resources that we're conducting mining studies on with a tail of exploration upside. Um, we're continuing to pursue that exploration angle. We think it's important and it'll add a lot of value, um, but I'll also talk about the resources in the context of where we're taking them from a study and development perspective. Um, I'll go straight into the uh, structure of the company. Look, it's, a, it's been around eight or nine years, Dukedon. We've got 121 sh million shares on issue, uh, a bit over 10 million options, market cap of 36 million. But importantly, we're w very well funded and as Paul uh, alluded to before, we uh, did a deal with Regis some time ago, just selling some gold tenements to them in the area. Um, and hence the cash position, we're sitting on $18.5 million of cash. And a small component of those are a couple of shareholdings that we've uh, got through either vending projects or doing a little bit of other investment, but uh, predominantly cash. Uh, very well funded and got a great intent around the development and the exploration side of things. Um, importantly, just to look at the shareholder information, you can see there 18.5% of the registers held by a guy called Kerry Humanis, who's probably pretty well known in this audience. There's a large institution that holds just under 10% and then directors and management are holding just over 10% of the whole company as well. Um, just a quick one on the board and management. Seamus is a lawyer by trade, um, worked in the minerals industry for his entire career mostly, always been part of it. Um, I'm a geologist, ex-WMC, ex-BHP, and then with Duke and a number of other little entities. And Heath has been, uh, he's a geologist by trade as well. He's, um, I guess, associated with IGO in the early days, uh, and then Dore, and uh, was part of Capricorn as well more recently, and is now doing a couple of other gigs as well. Um, look, we all know, sorry, there's a demand for nickel. Look, we've got upside in our portfolio. Um, we've got two resources, two nickel sulphide resources. Um, we've got an ex immense amount of exploration ground in there as well. Uh, and we're just working through that as we talk. There's a number of different development options and we put one out earlier um, last year that was a toll trading arrangement on Rosie. We're now looking at a combined C2 and Rosie combined going into a concentrator on site and tracking a concentrate off-site. And I'll talk to that a little bit in the presentation. Um, look, great, great place to start and find nickel sulphides. There's near other nickel sulphides, and we see those two resources as being critical indicators of what else is possible in the belt. Um, and we think there's a pretty attractive valuation on Dukedon at the moment, and I encourage you to go and have a look at that and get a share. Look, where we're positioned, um, that's our tenement package in black. Um, we're about a, just over 100 kilometres north of Laverton on what we call the Banja Road. The remainder of that Dukedon belt is held by Regis Resources and so they have three operating plants in the area and they collectively um, consume about 10 million tonnes per annum. So everything that supports the infrastructure comes in and out on that Banja Road from Laverton heads north and basically comes within a kilometre of our project. So we've got very good access. Um, it is an unsealed road, but it's a very good, good road in most parts, and it gets us within a kilometre of the Rosian C2 resource. Where, as the bird flies 130 kilometres from the Leinster concentrator, um, our toll treating study that we did, which I'll take you through, that actually considered trucking that the ore all the way down through Laverton across to Leonora and then back up to the Leinster area just to make sure that it was fully, fully understood what may be required. This is a, just a short video just to show you in three dimensions what Rosie and C2 look like. They're about two kilometres apart. That's the drilling that's been done. Both these deposits were found by IJO in the day. So there's about $20 million of drilling put into both of these deposits, but I'll just hit go on the... And this will just bring it up. So you can see the drill hole intercepts in red through there. That's the ore body of Rosie, the mineralised um, wire frame. 
um, it comes very close to surface. We, we kind of misunderstand the scale at times. It's about a kilometre long and about 700 metres at depth. Open down the bottom, that's the infrastructure out of the scoping study that we put in, the strike drives. The orange is all the EM anomalies and we think there's quite great potential at depth on Rosie still and it's still open. You can see some of those intercepts, including the 3.3 .3 at 3.5 at depth. We think that's the middle of an ore body rather than the edge of it. Uh, C2 is a broad low grade deposit, um, it's open pitable, again a couple hundred metres long, very very close to surface and it's essentially a strip profile so we get into the fresh component of it very quick and we've been doing some a little bit of uh, optimisation work around, around C2 to look at what the pit looks like. Um, look collectively at the moment we've got 95,000 tonnes of nickel metal um, 14,000 tonnes of copper and importantly and, and part of the value equation is that quarter of a million ounces of PGEs which is predominantly in Rosie. Uh, we think that's important. We actually do calculate out our resources on a nickel equivalent basis just to, as, at Rosie we do, um, just, to, just to understand that value. Um, look, we've, got, we've been doing some de-risking process. We've got some recent metallurgical work that's come out. All of those are positive and um, I think that's all pointing towards what we could do with Rosie. Um, just importantly on our tenements, the difference between the blue and the green there, the green is actually nickel rights. So Regis hold the underlying tenement. We have a nickel rights over the top of it and then we have access through uh, another contractual agreement to convert that into a mining tenement in the case of discovery. And the blue tenements are all our 100% own tenements. And I'll just point out the Tate project up to the north. I'll just talk about that right at the end of the uh, presentation because I think that's an interesting exploration play that we've got as well. The scoping study that we put out for toll treating on Rosie, um, it was done at a nickel price of $8 a pound, which almost seems irrelevant now. It was ranged around $7.50 to $8.50. Um, you can see there from a MPV and a pre pre-tax cash flow, it actually generates a lot of value. Um, you put in a $10 a pound price, which we're sitting at today, that number goes up significantly and we think there's a, a, an immense amount of value associated with Rosie. The pre-production capital number there, 18, that's probably gone up a little bit in the last uh, 12 months, but that's essentially a, a portal and a decline in getting us into the fresh rock component of the top of it at Rosie, and then that's the first production first piece of nickel sulphides that comes out of that ore, out of that ore body. Pretty simple mine design as you saw in that 3D image um, and the annual production sitting about 300,000 tonnes per annum at a, around about a 2% nickel equivalent number. Uh, breaking down the two deposits, um, look Rosie's got uh, 56,000 nickel tonnes and you can see that 230,000 ounces of PGs in it. C2 um, Interestingly, 38,000 nickel tonnes. We think that'll grow just easily, just on a little bit of optimisation. You can see in plan view there, two kilometres apart, sitting in that bulge ultramophic. We think that's a significant, uh, has significant potential to, to deliver more nickel sulphides in there. And there's a lot more to be worked out within the bulge than what we've already discovered and what's been found historically. <coughs> Rosie is a flat sheet and we sort of walk through that, but it's got some significant hips through it. Um, some, of the, some of the zones, and it kind of resolves into three main mining zones, but some of the zones are significantly thick, rich nickel sulphides with significant PGEs hanging out at those same intersections as well. There's a nice intersection, one of our better ones, obviously. Um, you know, over nine metres at 5% nickel, but significantly a lot of... Um, platinum, palladium and rhodium bouncing around in this deposit and broadly over the whole deposit we get about two and a half grams per tonne of PGEs through the whole thing. Um, C2, look C2 is a different beast, it's a broad um, low grade deposit, it's typified by these 10 metre plus intercepts of 0. 0.7 to 1% nickel. Um, it's, it's quite consistent in its nature um, and we reported at a certain level, which is what I've highlighted in that table on the left. Um, what we're looking at at the moment is just doing some mining optimization on the pit and possibly changing that cutoff grade a little bit. And we, you can see the inventory picks up significantly if we can drop that cutoff grade even, even by a small amount. We actually get a lot of nickel tons dropping into that pit and it becomes an important asset for the combined mining study that we're looking at. Metallurgically, both these deposits work really well. Um, 
Rosie can, can we, we really can sort of um, get two different combinations out of there. We can get a pure nickel concentrate with some PGs in it. We can go for a bulk concentrate in the upper levels, um, again, with, with lots of PGs in it. We've also looked at it just a, as a, uh, I guess, a, a different avenue, just looking at the PGs and whether we can pull those out separately to the nickel con. And we've kind of proven at a desktop, desktop uh, way that we can. Uh, and we think that's important just to prove to other offtake providers that we can do that as well. C2 actually was a surprise on the upside, produces a really, really nice concentrate. Um, that recovery will probably go up. This was an open, open cycle test. Um, as we work on that further, we think that'll get into the 80% recoveries. The iron DMGO is really nice on this. This is an iron rich and, and pyrotite and pyrite rich um, disseminated deposit. Um, and we can get the concentrate grades up into that slot of 11 to 18 per cent, but broadly it was landing at about a 13 per cent con for the most of it. Uh, the last couple of cycles on this particular test, we, we were looking at the rejection of iron to keep, get the iron down a little bit and the nickel concentrate grade up a little bit as well. So there's a lot of iron coming through that, and as we all know, it's important to some of the consumers of these products. Um, but it kind of surprised us on the upside, this, this level, and I think there's a little bit more to be given out of uh, C2 as well. Exploration side of things, um, where, oh, so this, this, is, this is down where C2 and Rosie are. The purple's ultramafic all the way up through, north through here, so that's 20 odd kilometres of strike. We're continuing to explore up through this belt. We're just coming to the end of an EM program that we've just been mowing down the entire, um, terrain with. Um, we've got a number of anomalies coming out of that. Uh, we, we really like this part of the world and we think it's an extension of what we see down in the south. Um, but obviously with further complications that we're still working through as well as far as geological complications go. Point of note, uh, we're getting rock chips up in through this camp oven area and we're getting some EM anomalism as well up through here. But some of these rock chips are quite remarkable. Um, and it just indicates it was, there's something more to be given up through there, through the exploration space. So. Look, going, going right off north, and so this is the Tate project. This is something different again. And um, these, these, these are two large mafic intrusions that were found in the tenement package. Um, that northernmost one is six kilometres long by a kilometre and a half wide, and the the other one's two, two by one. So they're large bodies, come in very late in the piece. It's a slightly different exploration model to what we apply down in the, uh, the rest of the Dukedom belt. Um, one of the, the northernmost of those magnetic anomalies has had a historical BHP drill hole through it, which indicates it's a mafic body. It's got little background values of nickel and copper in there. Um, we're currently just walking over that with an EM crew as well. And um, if we get any sort of anomalism there, we'll continue to pursue this. But a different model and we think it's uh, significant from a, from a technical perspective, if this comes together, this will be something, uh, something of size. Look, that's really the, the end of the presentation. Um, look, we're, we're well funded. We're, we're focused on some of the mining studies that we're doing. We think we've got some exceptional exploration ground in the background there and we'll continue to pursue that and um, look where we'll continue to allocate funds for the exploration side of things um, but we should be pulling out some uh, more interesting mining studies over the next couple of months and delivering those to market and that'll really give us a focus on which which way and how we go about taking the next steps with the Dukedom project but I'd encourage you to pay attention. Thanks very much. <laughs>